Hi, friends. Welcome to Corelight Spiritual Weather Report. It's April 28th, 2024, and I'm very happy to be with you, as always. This is Brad. I'm calling in today from my home at Blida River Canyon in Limpopo, South Africa. And it's just been such a beautiful, beautiful time for me here. I've been here the past five months, and uh, I'm leaving soon. I'm, I'm heading up into the Northern Hemisphere for several months. So this will be the last broadcast for a while from the foot of the sacred mountain here at the Blighter River Canyon. And so I invite you to just receive that beautiful energy. If you can tune in and meditation and feel it, I invite you to do that. And wow, I have to say, wow, there have been some very, very intense energies lately. I wonder if you're feeling that. I know a lot of people who have been most of the people I know are using this time to process some very deep shadow and to use this opportunity to take a quantum leap in their spiritual growth. I, and I know that's what I've been doing for the past week or so. I, it's really been intense. We, we just had a full moon and I'm sure there's uh, that's been one reason, but there there have been other intense uh, astrology that has supported the deep inner work. And and honestly, I haven't really been tracking it very closely. I've just been <laughs> I feel a little bit like I've been keeping my head above water. I've been using this opportunity to hold a strong witness and process whatever arises. And I I hope if you're being affected in this way that, that you're coping okay as well and staying on your surfboard. And if you're not, if you're just having a great time and living in joy, well, that's great. Enjoy it as much as you can. Um, no, there's no right or wrong to this. You know, the energy affects all of us differently. We also just had Earth Day and the anniversary of Leslie's Enlightenment. Uh, the, both those days are the same. They're on April 22nd. And I, I always love how those two events amazingly landed on the same day. Um, as I said in the email that I just sent out to the Corelite community about it, which I hope you all received, it always reminds me about the, the very auspicious connection between Mother Earth and our path of spiritual awakening. So for me, it's a great reminder that the spiritual path and the worldly path are one and the same thing. No, no difference between our spiritual path and our worldly path. And that's a wonderful reminder for all of us, no matter where we are on the spiritual journey. So before we begin our session today, I want to welcome everybody who's new to Core Light, And I also welcome all of our old friends, too, as always. And for those who are new, Every month, I tune in on what's happening in the collective consciousness, and I'm always shown a few key themes to talk about on these podcasts. So today, I got three themes. They are, number one, thriving in increasingly polarized times. Number two, moving from separation to unity consciousness. Number three, clearing shadow to achieve a goal. And for anyone who's new to the Spiritual Weather Report calls, I start by offering a guided meditation, and then we speak about the prevailing energies that are affecting us and also about the spiritual principles that are most helpful for us right now. And then we always have time for questions and answers, and we close with a brief guided meditation or a prayer or whatever we have time for. And if you need to leave before the call ends, you can always listen to the recording later. We do send out the link to our email list, and it's also posted on YouTube. So before we start with our guided meditation, just a few little housekeeping things, some updates for you. The big news, can I have a drum roll, <laughs> please? <laughs> We're planning to launch For the Love of Animals, our online course, my, my online course that I'm co-leading with Anna Breitenbach in mid-May. That's just a couple weeks away. And I know I've been saying this for a few months, that it's coming soon, but it is finally here, <laughs> if you trust me. <laughs> so I thank you for your patience while we made it perfect for you. That was very, very important to us. We wanted to just get it perfect. 
So um, if you want to know more about the course, you can find out about it on our sacred activism page at corelight.org. That's on the main menu. You just go to sacred activism and then you'll find the interspecies communication page there. There's a little two minute video right now about the course, but please stay tuned uh, for the email announcement in the middle of May, which will include a link to a new full web page about the course. So again, thank you for your patience, and I invite you to tune in inwardly and just feel into if this course is for you. And if it is, I really look forward to seeing you there. I tend to think of these things as a, a divine appointment, and you'll know if you have that divine appointment or not. Number two, let me, I'm looking at my notes here. We are also in the process of re-presencing one of Leslie's courses that we've offered before. It's called The Seven Portals of Spiritual Awakening. And that's a course Leslie offered a long time ago, but it's very timeless, and we are re-presencing it, as I said. So please stay tuned for that one as well. We will be announcing that by email later this year. Lastly, I am going to be attending a conference at the end of May. So unfortunately, I need to cancel the May spiritual weather report. But there was just no way to fit it in. I really tried to juggle things, and I just can't do it. So I apologize, and I will miss you next month. But I, I look forward to being with you again in June. And that uh, spiritual weather report will be on Sunday, June 30th. Okay, so without further ado... Uh, let's have our guided meditation. And I invite you to close your eyes and get comfortable either sitting or lying on the floor or whatever, reclining in bed, whatever you like to do. But I invite you to just close your eyes and relax and take a few long, slow, deep breaths, breathing in all the light and the life force that surrounds you. and exhaling all the tension in the body, just letting go, completely relaxing, breathing in the present moment, and breathing out any worries about the past or the future. Breathing in love, and breathing out shadow, and stress. And now, as you continue to breathe, let's all do a muscular relaxation from head to toes. And I invite you to scan the body from, for any tension. You might be feeling any stress in the muscles. So like a leaf, falling from a tree. Just allow your attention to slowly and gently scan down your body, starting with the scalp, gently flowing down the head, checking all the muscles of the face and the head, consciously breathing light into areas like the eyes where we hold a lot of tension in all the little tiny muscles around the eyes, cheeks, the jaw, all the way down the back of the head, the neck, shoulders, relaxing all the muscles as you scan the body. Just feel a warm, gentle energy flowing over you, all the way down the arms to the fingertips. Remembering your breathing, breathing in light, and exhaling any tension in the body. Just scanning the upper torso, the chest, and upper back. And gently flowing down the torso. Feel the diaphragm area. It's also a place where we often hold on to a lot of tension. So breathe 
light and energy deep into the diaphragm. And with an exhale, deeply let go of any stress. Feeling this warmth of your attention flowing down the body, scanning for any place where you're holding on to tension. Also, the pelvis and the hips are a place where we hold on to tension. So I invite you to just slowly and gently breathe light into the hips and especially to the psoas muscles, which are the muscles that run down the front of the hips. Exhaling any tension that you might be feeling. And feeling this warm energy flowing down your legs all the way down to the tips of your toes. And just feeling yourself washed clean all the way from head to fingertips and toes. Washed clean of any tension. Continuing to breathe in light and love into the body. And now I invite you to drop your grounding cord down into the earth. You find your grounding cord, if you're new to this, by putting your attention on the root chakra, which is at the base of the spine, at the perineum. And it's okay if you don't know anything about chakras. That's totally fine. It doesn't matter. You can just visualize and try to feel and follow along. And eventually you will feel it if you set your intention that that's what you'd like. So I invite you to feel when you put your attention on the root, how it naturally, very gently opens, relaxes. Dropping your grounding cord all the way down to the center of the earth. feeling it connecting with the core of the earth. Visualize the core of the earth in whatever way you like. Some people see it as a, an iron crystal or gold or a radiant ball of light, whatever you like. And just feel your energy commingling with the energy of the earth. And then draw that energy back up into your body through the soles of your feet. And as you continue to breathe and relax, feel gravity very gently pulling you towards the earth. Relaxing your body. And feeling Mother Earth supporting you from beneath in the form of the floor and the chair or the bed. And just let go. Just feel very grounded and relaxed. And let go into the arms of Mother Earth. (sighs) Like a little baby being cradled in the arms of the mother, feeling completely safe, nurtured and held, nowhere to go, nothing to do. Just being right here, right now, relaxing, giving yourself over to your spiritual journey to your journey in this physical body which is one with the earth it's made of earth just allowing yourself to feel that feel that deep connection the body has with the earth mother earth feels very rooted, very grounded, very anchored to the earth. And it's very healing. 
as you allow yourself to just go yin, as we say, which is receptive. Just go completely receptive and allow yourself to absorb this beautiful earth energy pouring in from beneath. Mm, it's so peaceful and relaxing. So grounding, healing. So as you hold this beautiful space of grounding, I'm going to say a little prayer and an invocation for our call today. We call on Great Spirit, Divine Mother, Father God, the self that we all are. We invite in our highest spiritual guides, all of the angels and the divine beings who surround us in the highest love and support. We ask that you please surround us with a beautiful cocoon of golden white light and love and healing energy. And whether or not you're listening to this call in the future or you're with us here present today, doesn't matter. We are all part of this beautiful field of love. There is no time and space at this level. So I invite you to just be aware that we all share this field of love, this timelessness. And I invite you to receive it. To let yourself absorb it. Deep into the cells of the body, feeling these trillions of cells in your body like miniature sponges absorbing this beautiful golden white light in this field of unconditional love that we're surrounded by. Spirit is supporting that we're all creating together. I ask please that our conversation today be guided into the highest love and the highest wisdom and hold our hands as we walk out into the world into our soul's highest purpose, letting us share our light and our love with the world at a time when it's so, so needed. And we include at this time a prayer for all the beings on earth who suffer including from natural disasters and wars, illness, homelessness, poverty, physical poverty, spiritual poverty, whatever it is. All those who are in pain, especially those who are in war or affected by war. We're all affected by war, but specifically people who are right there in the countries where wars are happening and the surrounding countries. And we pray for peace. We pray for an end to war on this planet. We ask, Great Spirit, that you please make us instruments of your peace. Where there is war, let us sow peace. And we pray for protection and inspiration and courage for all those who are working for universal peace on this planet. And we're so, so grateful. We're very grateful for these bodies that we get to wear at this most amazing time on this beautiful planet, this pivot point between ages, moving from the age of separation into the new paradigm of the heart. What a gift, what a blessing that we get to be here for this and help midwife this extraordinary new paradigm that is birthing. So we give thanks for this opportunity, even though it can be challenging whenever there's great change. And we offer our thanks for this time we share together. 
right now in this field of love and all the blessings we receive in life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So when you feel ready, I invite you to slowly bring your awareness back into the room and into your body. Slowly begin to wiggle your fingers and toes. When you feel ready, you can open your eyes. And I invite you to just continue to feel this beautiful energy that surrounds us, this field of love, even even though I know most people need to multitask during these calls. Uh, one of the, we we do there's a lot of information and a lot of talking, but honestly the the most important part I think is this uh, energy transmission that comes through. So I invite you to receive, and if you get too distracted, just uh, come back to being quiet and still for a few moments to receive again. Okay, so let's dive into our topics for today. I wanted to start with a quote today. This is from the famous Middle Eastern poet long ago, Khalil Gibran. A man living outside the circle of delusion, which imprisons most men, has a question of everyone he meets, usually silently. Can you get outside yourself for even a split second? to hear something you've never heard before. Those who learn to hear will enter a new world. So the first topic for today is thriving in increasingly polarized times. And I think we're all noticing how the world is becoming so extraordinarily (laughs) increasingly polarized. And with every passing day, we're being invited more and more into separation and fear of the quote-unquote other. And nowadays, it feels like it's getting harder and harder to have any kind of meaningful conversations about what's happening in the world. Because if you talk about your support of something, then automatically uh, people conclude that you're in a certain camp and you're taking a polarity and they make all kinds of assumptions about you based on that one thing and you become the quote-unquote other. And I know you know this is around politics and the right and the left and wars and environment and vaccines and climate change and on and on and on. There's more. So The list is a long one. So I think most people are just avoiding those kinds of conversations these days. We we don't want to talk about our opinions because we don't want to get into an argument and then get polarized and um, possibly excommunicated (laughs) from our tribe and from our friendships. And, uh, And the world is being divided, you know. Um, it, it's divided into these, um, what some people are calling hostile opinion tribes. So I suppose avoiding talking about anything meaningful <laughs> is one way to go. <laughs> but it's not going to resolve the issues that we're facing, is that? So then what would the answer be? How, how do we resolve this relentless invitation into the increasing polarization of our world. I made a little list of questions that I would imagine uh, for, for most of you who are listening to this are rhetorical, but I'm going to ask them anyway, because somehow I feel like it's important to name some of the questions that we're all facing. And I think they're good to ponder as well, even if they might seem like simple little yes or no questions. So I'm just going to read this little list of questions for you. If we love something, does that mean we hate its opposite? 
Can we be authentic and disagree with each other? Is it possible to honor both the yin and the yang? And we've talked about that in a lot of our recent calls in the past months, the, the importance of seeing the power of both sides, both the yin and the yang, and that one side is not superior and the other inferior, uh, even though we're taught that the yang is powerful and the yin is powerless. The truth is that both are equally powerful, but in different ways. And so in a time when we're being invited into choosing sides, it's important to remember that we live in a world of duality where the opposites are always dancing with each other. And that's what it is. It's a dance. Dark and light are always appearing like they battle with each other. But but every day, the day conquers the night, right? And then the night conquers the day again. And so this is the metaphor for this eternal dance of light and dark on our beautiful planet Earth. And it's perfectly depicted in the yin-yang symbol. If you know, if, if you don't know what that is, it's the, the circle with the black swirl and the white swirl that seem to be, you know, moving and swirling around each other. And that symbol also so beautifully illustrates how each side of a pair of opposites contains within it the seed of its opposite side. Um, you know how the big white swirl has the small black dot in it and the big black swirl has the small white dot in it. And that's showing us that nothing is completely black or white. Everything contains this little seed of its opposite side within it. So nothing is as it seems on, on earth. We really need to remember to see beyond the surface appearance, to see the million shades of gray between the black and the white. And I think the question becomes, can we appreciate the tapestry of the world and, and all the vast diversity of, of its threads that are woven into it? And, and even though there are so many different colors and even though they pull in so many different directions, can we appreciate it? Can we allow it? Can we be with it? Can we love it? And I think in this world of ours, this modern world where attention spans are <laughs> a few seconds at most, you know, and we, we, uh, we have time for sound bites and TikTok videos and Twitter X, and we find that the capacity for anything that's a bit nuanced, nuanced, um, understandings, nuanced conversations. Um, can we find that capacity for that nuance? How are we at practicing things like listening instead of talking? Giving people the benefit of the doubt. Suspending judgment. Neither believing nor disbelieving. Trying to understand the nuances of someone else's opinion. So these are all qualities of statesmanship. Or at another level, you could uh, consider it spiritual maturity. And what we're really talking about here is the practice of witnessing, which is also known as the objective observer. And, and since I speak so much about witnessing on these calls. I'm not going to take time to explain it now in depth, but if you're new to Corelight and you want to know more about witnessing, you can learn about that practice in our book, Leslie's in my book, The Marriage of Spirit, Enlightened Living in Today's World. And there's a whole chapter on witnessing in that book. And it offers some very simple but very powerful practices for witnessing and also for integrating polarities. And these Practices are designed to help us thrive in, in this world of duality and polarization. 
so you can get the book on our web store at corelight.org, or it's available on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. And what's so amazing to me is that Leslie's inner spiritual guides gave her those marriage of spirit practices so long ago. Back in the 70s, she was starting to receive them in, in the 80s. And by using them, she experienced her enlightenment. But they're more relevant now than ever before. I, I, I mean, who could have known that the world would become so unbelievably polarized in our current times? Who who would have guessed <laughs> the, the separation would become so intense that we can't even have a conversation with each other? I mean, I don't know about you, but I never dreamed that was even possible. Um, you know, Leslie always talked about um, the increasing intensity and the acceleration of the polarization. But wow, here we are. Um, so just before we continue with the, the, the thread of conversation, I just am feeling guided to share as an aside that uh, I, I know since most people don't read anymore, that's why I'm in the process of turning the Marriage of Spirit book into a series of short social media videos. And I'm super excited about this project. I've mentioned before uh, that there's this really wonderful, very generous foundation in London that is supporting this project. And in fact, that's why I'm leaving South Africa this week to go back to London for a few months to move that project forward. Um, and the hope and the plan is that, that these little videos will be uplifting and engaging and fun and they're going to be free. And we, we just hope that they're going to help people to learn these simple little practices more quickly and easily because um, knowing how to navigate the world of such intense separation is vital for our times. And I'm sure if you're listening to this call, you know that. And and the way we can thrive in these times of ever-increasing polarization is by knowing how to integrate the dualities. We can thrive even in the system of extreme separation if we know how to witness, if we know how to find the middle way, if we know how to clear what's called the shadow side, the hidden side of any pair of opposites. And it's really that simple. Um, it just takes knowing how to do it and making it a daily practice. So if you're new to this work, there are two very simple things you can do to get started. And I know for most of you, this will just be a quick reminder if you've been around Coralite for a while, but let me just mention them. So number one is to make a commitment to institute the witness in your life and to start the practice of witnessing because everything starts with the commitment. So that that's where it begins. I remember that was the very first thing Leslie ever told me was that one thing. And if, if you've been around the block and you've been witnessing for a long time, you can also commit to recommit. Let's say you can recommit to the witness. You can recommit to strengthening the witness and it's just that that mindset of a neutral, uh, well, let's call it objective observer. I know the word neutrality sometimes is misconstrued, so we call it the objective observer. And so, so the practice is about going through your day, just starting to notice, starting to name what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're observing. And again, you you can learn more about what that witnessing practice is in the Marriage of Spirit book. And the second thing, second simple practice, is when something uncomfortable or something unusual arises for you, any kind of issue that you'd like to clear, you simply ask yourself, what's the opposite of this? And then you write that pair of opposites in your journal. And so you're just really becoming aware of the polarities so that you can witness them better. And um, it's really as simple as that. I mean, that's how it begins anyway. There's there's a lot more you can do to strengthen the witness and to process the polarities and clear all that uh, that shadow stuff. But but that little two-step process is super simple and, and super powerful. And it's a great way to begin. So 
just a reminder for most of you, but um, if there are new people on the call, that is a, a really great exercise to begin with. All right, so let's move on to our next topic. And it's very related to what we're already talking about. The next topic is moving from separation to unity consciousness. So yesterday was another very auspicious day. It was the 30th anniversary of the first democratic election in South Africa, which was April 27th, 1994. And it's when Nelson Mandela was elected. Isn't that amazing? I didn't see a lot about it in the news. So I was surprised about that. But um, Leslie and I came to South Africa at that time to meditate and to pray and, you know, just to hold space for the election. And we both had a, a very powerful, a profound spiritual experience, which I thought I should share with you today. Um, I wrote about it in my book, Living with Enlightenment, so you, you may have heard some of it, but I'll, uh, you may have read about some of it, but I'll share a little bit with it, you today, not all of it. So um, you might know that Leslie is South African by birth, and I'm an American by birth. I'm a U.S. citizen, but South Africa is my adopted country because of my life partnership with Leslie. And um, my my relationship with South Africa started exactly 30 years ago, so I'm having <laughs> I'm having my re my anniversary with South Africa too. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been to South Africa. Mandela's election was such an auspicious moment in history, and I just I fell in love with the country. Um, and and just in case you don't know South Africa's history, the short version is that for hundreds of years there was colonial rule. And then from the 40s, the 1940s to the early 1990s, there was the system of apartheid. And the word apartheid means separation. And it was the world's most uh, extensive, let's say, legalized system of racism ever in the history of the planet. And it was incredibly oppressive for, for both uh, people who were considered non-whites as well as for whites. And it was a way of separating the, the races, separating the white race from blacks and Indians and anybody of who was considered mixed race. So these groups could not vote. Uh, they could not live in whites-only areas, and they were subjected to all kinds of other restrictions. And the whites ruled the country. And I, I just, before we go on, I, I just want to interject here that uh, I think partly why this touches my heart so deeply, this, this country and its history, is because I hope I can get through this without crying too much. It's deeply, touched, this, this whole subject touches me so much, but I was born in the 1960s in the southeast of the U.S., and I spent a number of my early childhood years in a, a, a rural area, a very rural area in the Deep South, strangely enough. Um, it was when the civil rights movement was just starting. And so I had my own experiences of that kind of racism in the country of my birth. So I am um, connected to this process, and I'm certainly not pointing any fingers at South Africa or saying it had a monopoly on racism. That's not what this is about. And I feel very blessed that my parents raised me in a colorblind way. And um, they were strong advocates for integration. And they, they worked for integration. So my first year of school was the first year that black and white children went to school together. And, and my parents helped with that effort. And many of my school friends were black. And um, I remember when I had a birthday party where we were all at my house, both the black and the white kids together. And um, my parents received a threatening letter the next day from the KKK, the, the Ku Klux Klan, explaining that that was just not what we did here. And uh, <laughs> my parents sort of said, oh, yeah. Uh, so they, they told me later about it when I was older and they said they basically just ignored the letter and, you know, I continued to play with my friends no matter what anybody's skin color was. But I'm just 
grateful to my parents for having the courage to do that and to raise me in a colorblind way. Um, so anyway, back to what I was saying, the, the, the system of apartheid was so oppressive and so entrenched that most South Africans never believed that they would live to see a free and fair democratic election in their lifetime. And I, I know that was true for Leslie and for her friends and they all, she, Leslie and all of them talked about it. Um, and I was privy to that and, and uh, they thought the whole thing was a miracle. So I'm sure what we've got South Africans who listen to this call and I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so like I said, I wrote a lot about this story in my book, Living with Enlightenment. So I'm not going to go into all the details here. They're, they're kind of a lot of stories within the story. But the part of the story that I really wanted to share with you today is that when we came for the election of Nelson Mandela, I had a very powerful experience of unity consciousness. And I thought I should share it with you because it applies to today's topic of thriving in times of increasing polarization. So I share it in the hopes that it, it might be helpful to you in navigating this intense time of separation in the world. I wasn't the only one uh, to have this experience of unity consciousness. Um, I, I know a lot of other people in South Africa did as well. It was extraordinary. I, I really, I, I know I'm not going to be able to do it justice by talking about it. I know it fell short in my book. I tried. But, you know, with these experiences of unity consciousness, uh, words fall short. It's something that you have to experience uh, and not describe. But I'll try. And so um, we were not sitting in meditation in a lotus posture, <laughs> which is what most people think about when you think about unity consciousness. Uh, I was literally walking around the streets of Johannesburg and, and random people were just smiling, just beaming at each other. And, and people would talk to strangers and people would say, do you feel that? What, what is this? What am I feeling? And, um, you know, people were confused by it, but, uh, but they were so happy that it didn't really matter. It was just this feeling of, um, like a, a buoyancy, uh, like like walking on a cloud. You know, that's how I felt. I felt like I was walking a, a few feet off the sidewalk. It was a feeling of elation and a feeling of of being carefree and um, like a, a pivotal moment in time. And uh, like like the world had stopped. You know, like like we were in this bubble. We were in this pivot point, and like the eye of the hurricane. And Leslie and I knew what it was, you know, it was unity consciousness because we'd had that experience before in meditation. But um, I think probably almost everybody in the city and, and probably in the whole country, I don't know, it's, it's because they were thinking the same thought. That's why it happened. And what was that thought that they were thinking? Freedom. There was that, that one universal thought form, freedom, you know, finally here after decades of challenge and oppression. And um, I've never experienced anything like that before or since where an entire city or, or a country is thinking that same high vibration thought with such a profound experience of unity consciousness. And I... I feel like we were given a taste of something. Everybody who experienced that here in South Africa I got the sense that um, it was like a foreshadowing, I want to say, something like that. I got the sense that the whole world can be like that one day when more people become of one mind and, and one heart and and when enough people truly hold these higher ideals in the in the forefront of their consciousness, um, you know, the desire for things like freedom and equality and peace and truth and uh, forgiveness and, and so forth, you know, all those heart states. Um, I, I do feel like that's where the world is heading. You know, that that's the new paradigm of the heart, the new era 
in human consciousness that we're on the cusp of. We're completing this uh, 6,000 or, or, or so year cycle. Some people say 10,000, whatever it is uh, that, that some people call the age of patriarchy or the age of separation. And we're moving into an era of heart-centered consciousness, which we call the new paradigm of the heart. So to, to bring the conversation full circle, we're, we're in this time of increasing polarization, so much so that you can't even express your opinions without being put into a category and separated from everybody else. There's a, a lack of ability to have nuanced conversations and to see the various shades of gray between the black and the white. And so isn't it interesting that, that that's what apartheid means? It means separation. So I think South Africa holds a seed. It holds something that's very important for the world. Um, we're in this time when we need to focus on the things that unite us, on our common ground, on the, the things that we can all agree on and that, uh, that help bring us together not on the things that separate us. So what are the common goals? What are the ideals that can help us move into unity, even if we might disagree about how to get there or some of the details around them? What are those common ideals? And I'm asking you, can you think of any? I mean, I have my own list, but I wonder, uh, just to give you a moment to think about it, what would you put on a list of common ideals and goals that we all share that could help bring us into unity? So I've, I've made my own little list here of a few things that I think we can all agree on, and I'm going to read them to you. And this is in the hopes that we can all hold space Pray, visualize, you know, uh, whatever we like to do for, for these things to manifest. Okay, here's my list. We all love the earth. And we all want a healthy environment. We all love life. We all want to see life flourish. We all want good health. We all want safety. We all want prosperity, including having enough to eat and having a place to live. We all want peace and no more war. We all want freedom. We all want to be loved and to be able to love whoever we want to love. So that's just a short little list, but maybe uh, for home practice, you, you might want to try to think of some more things to add to that list. And I think what I'll do is at the end of the talk today, I'll say a little prayer uh, on on behalf of all of us, and I'll, I'll make an offering of this, this list that I started for us. And we can ask for Spirit to help us to bring this into manifestation. Okay, so I think that's enough on that. Let's... Uh, let's move on. The, the final topic for today is clearing shadow to achieve a goal. And this topic is also, this is a continuation of the first two topics. Um, it's kind of the story continued a little bit. It, it, a few years after Nelson Mandela was elected, South Africa went very deep down into the shadows of corruption and uh, greed and crime and illness and all kinds of things that really brought the country, it started bringing the country to its knees. And, and many people, you know, there was such a honeymoon period. There was such elation and joy about the new rainbow nation and people were so excited and happy and, you know, we had that experience of unity consciousness. Um, it was such a shattering that it went the direction it went. And and many people became just incredibly disillusioned. 
and for good reason. You know, uh, the shadow really rose up and showed itself in high relief. And it still continues today, uh, as a matter of fact. The shadow, um, it just, it just seems to intensify with each passing day. And I, I would think, as we all probably know, this is happening all over the world. It's not just South Africa. Every country's shadow is rising up <laughs> in its full glory for all to see. It, the shadow is not hidden anymore. There's nowhere you can go on planet Earth without seeing the shadow. Um, it looks a little bit different from country to country, but every country has its own flavor of shadow. It's just that it's not invisible like it used to be. Um, the shadow is showing itself to us everywhere. We get we get to see it. We get to name it. We get to deal with it, process it, whatever we do with it. Fear it, which I know many people do. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with with fearing it. Uh, it's just as long as we witness the fear. We're aware that, that it brings up fear. Uh, that's one of the the witnessing practices. It's so important. And so that's the gift of our times. You know, um, the light is so bright that the darkest shadows are revealing themselves. And that means that we can name them and we can process them and we can clear them and release them because once the light is shined on the shadow, what happens? It dissolves. And it's that principle that it takes one candle, only one candle to illuminate a dark room. It's such a great metaphor for this this principle we're talking about. And also um, the other one that comes to mind is the, the shadow is the darkest where the light is the brightest. That's another very apt metaphor for our times. So I remember when this happened back in the in the 90s in South Africa, um, I remember talking to Leslie about it a lot. So many South Africans were getting so disillusioned about the state of the country. And, and as I said, it was totally understandable. Um, it was just hard not to feel disillusioned and hopeless and meaningless and you know it was all the you know all the work was for naught and all of that stuff that comes up and what leslie explained to me was profound it's something i've always retained and if you've been around a while you might remember this she said that south africa had set a very high goal with its new constitution the new South African constitution was dedicated to equality in so many unprecedented ways, including equality with uh, respect to things like race and creed and gender and sexual orientation and, and even the rights of animals. So it was a goal that the South African collective had set for itself. And of course, that's not an easy task. You know, it's a very high ideal, but it's also not unattainable. And if you've been on a conscious spiritual path for any length of time, you know it's impossible to jump right into the enlightened state. Any kind of significant change is a long-term process. To evolve and, and grow and discover who we truly are, we, we must take a look in the mirror and get real with ourselves and face the truth of what we see. And that's the path. It's, it's a path of what some, you could call making the unconscious conscious. It's also uh, referred to in some circles as clearing work or shadow work. And I kind of use all those terms interchangeably. And if you're new today, this this is what we teach at Corelight. We talk a lot more about it in our books and our audios and courses and so forth, but especially in the book that I've been mentioning today, The Marriage of Spirit, that's the best place to start if you want to learn more about the, the clearing work that we, we offer. 
So to continue this thread, this is, I'm, I'm, uh, stay with me, please. I'm bringing this into a, uh, or a conclusion here. So what's true for an individual is also true for a collective because a collective is just a group of individuals. So basically, South Africa had set a very high goal for itself, and it was really just beginning a longer-term journey based on its commitment to the new enlightened constitution. And it was starting to move into the phase of having the shadow rise up to the surface because we have to clear the shadow aspects, which are... Um, all of the impediments, let's say, that would, would stand in the way of achieving whatever that end goal is that we've set. We have to clean out the basement to reach the heights. There's a amazing, wonderful Indian saint, Sri Aurobindo, who said, you can only go as high as you're willing to go low. And, and so I, I want to give you a couple of examples to illustrate this principle. Uh, one of them is a personal example. Um, it happened, it was to me, it happened to me. It was um, back in the late 90s. And a group of, uh, five, there were five of us, a small group, me and three other people. We had a three-month retreat. We decided to have a three-month med meditation retreat in the countryside just outside Santa Fe, just about a 15-minute drive from Leslie's in my home. And the way it, we had a whole, med, it was like a Vipassana retreat, if you've ever been on one of those, where you, you meditate for an hour, you do a walking sitting, and then you do a walking meditation for 20 minutes, and then you go back into a sitting meditation for 45 minutes, and you kind of do that all day long. You take little breaks from the sitting, but you're basically meditating all day long, with the exception of meals and sleeping. And after about a month and a half, we were as high as kites. <laughs> we had reached <laughs> these ecstatic states. We were having all these psychic experiences. We were in bliss. And uh, and the way the retreat worked was uh, we were on our own. And Leslie would occasionally drop in as she was guided. Like her inner guides would say, go now. And she'd drive over and she would show up at the perfect moment. And the first couple of weeks or more, she didn't even show up. So we were just getting started, I guess. But eventually she started showing up, you know, now and then. And she would kind of give us some feedback and she'd meditate with us. And this one day, about halfway through the retreat, she showed up and she kind of marched into the <laughs> room. Well, she marched into the room and she said, what are you doing? You're you're doing great, but you've reached a ceiling. You've plateaued. You can continue to do this if you want. You you can meditate for the rest of the three months, the other the, the uh, further six weeks. But if you do, you won't go any higher. You'll stay at this plateau. You'll just enjoy it. It's your choice. You can do that or you could choose to use these next six weeks to process, to do the shadow clearing work. And we were all sort of like, uh, I don't know, resistant, let's say. We were just a little disconsolate because we were just enjoying ourselves so much. And, um, and yet we knew that it was such a rare opportunity. And it was really our opportunity to be productive and to, uh, to ascend to new heights. So we had a little confab and we decided to to take up Leslie's advice and to use the last half the, of the retreat to do shadow clearing work. So we we still would meditate, you know, in the morning, uh, once in the morning and once at the end of the day. But the rest of the time we'd sit in a circle and we were so psychically attuned to each other from having been in meditation for a month and a half we would just naturally, four of us would just sort of all look at one person and go, what's happening with you? And the person would say, oh, well, you know, I'm in a process. I This thing came up for me. Or or the three of us would look at two people and we'd say, what's going on with you two? And, you know, someone would say, oh, well, she said something to me and it reminded me of what my mother used to say to me. And 
um, you know, and we help them process their way through whatever shadow work they were doing. They're, you know, they were clearing out the basement. And I'm telling you, Leslie was so right, because by the end of the retreat, I had definitely reached new heights in meditation. I, I just was, it was extraordinary how much the clearing work helped us to all rise to a new level. So I share that with you just as an example of um, of how that works. Maybe you've experienced it yourself. Um, I would assume many people have. There's one more example I'd like to give you. Uh, the uh, it's a collective example, and it's uh, it's about South Africa. And so, in South Africa, as as some of you probably know, there was uh, a very important movement uh, towards healing. Let's say that started up after the 1994 election, and it was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the concept was that anyone who admitted their guilt or was found guilty, but, uh, you know, asked for forgiveness for crimes that were committed during the apartheid era would be uh, treated leniently. They wouldn't have to go to jail. I, I don't remember all the rules, but it was essentially uh, it was an opportunity. It was a it, it was a way it, it it helped demonstrate how a deeply divided culture could could begin a process of healing through truth telling and also through empathy and through uh, an acknowledgement of the shared suffering that happened. So there were so many extraordinary stories of healing that came out of that Truth and Reconciliation Committee. But there's one in particular that I, I thought I would read to you today because it's so powerful. And please forgive me if you've heard this story already, but it's so uplifting. I, I think it's worth the reminder if you've already heard it. Uh, there are quite a few different authors who've written about this story, and I just picked one online. I, I, uh, I'm reading one from the website called internationalforgiveness.com. The story is called Become My Son. I hope I can get through it without crying. <laughs> After apartheid ended in South Africa, a white police officer named Mr. Fundabook was put on trial. The court found that he had come to a woman's home, shot her son at point blank range, and then burned the young man's body on a fire while he and his officers partied nearby. The woman's husband was killed by the same men, and his body was also burned. I can't fathom the source or the energy needed to fuel such cruelty, but more unfathomable is the surviving woman's response, the mother of the son and the wife to the husband murdered and burned. What must she have thought and felt as she sat in the courtroom being burdened and re-traumatized by the evidence? A member of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Commission turned to her and asked, So what do you want? How should justice be done for this man? That's the right question, isn't it? What is justice? How can it be achieved? How does it look different from mere retribution and punishment? But the judge asked, how should justice be done for this man, not for this surviving woman? What would this wife and mother say in the face of such murderous cruelty that further caused indignity to her husband's and son's remains? I want three things, the woman said confidently. I want first to be taken to the place where my husband's body was burned so that I can gather up the dust. And give his remains a decent burial. My husband and son were my only family. I want secondly for Mr. Funderbook to become my son.
I would like for him to come twice a month to the ghetto and spend a day with me so that I can pour out on him whatever love I still have. This is truly a breathtaking request. We can finish her sentence starting with, I would like for him to come twice a month to the ghetto and spend a day with me so that I dot, 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 fill in the blank. So I can get him to feel the crushing poverty I live with. So I can have him feel the full void of my loss with no husband or son. So I can have him feel every distrusting eye scrutinize him as the minority in our community. But no, she finishes her request with, so that I can pour out on him whatever love I still have. And finally, I would like Mr. Funderbook to know that I offer him my forgiveness because Jesus Christ died to forgive. This was also the wish of my husband. And so, I would kindly ask someone to come to my side and lead me across the courtroom so that I can take Mr. Funderbook in my arms, embrace him, and let him know that he is truly forgiven. The end. Whew, sorry. And I just want to add on to that story. I am pretty sure what happened was that Mr. Funderbook fainted in the courtroom when the old woman came over to hug him. Pretty sure I read that in one of the tellings of the story. But, I mean, isn't that just the most extraordinary story? And I, I share it with you not just because it's such a heart opener, but also because... It's just this amazing illustration of how this journey of clearing the shadow starts with facing the truth, with uncovering those aspects that have been hidden from us. And then, you know, there's a journey of, of looking at that truth and getting real and, you know, witnessing and naming and all the things we've been talking about today. And then ultimately, it leads to compassion and forgiveness and unconditional love. And that was the, the beauty and the power of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And unfortunately for South Africa, there was, um, let's say, significant resistance to it, to the, to the committee. As you can imagine, not everybody wants to do that clearing work. Not everybody wants to look in the mirror and reveal the truth and make the unconscious conscious. So it really didn't last long enough to create a, uh, a deeper healing. I think it might have lasted for a year or two, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's a perfection to the time that it lasted. It was what it needed to be. Uh, but if it had continued for longer, it would have brought about a deeper healing for the country. Um, but I, really, the truth is, it's amazing that it happened at all. I mean, I remember when it happened, and Leslie and I were like, oh, my God, this what a country. This Isn't this just extraordinary that, that this Truth and Reconcilia Reconciliation Commission even exists? You know, it was uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela that, really spearheaded that as far as I know. It was just an extraordinary beginning of, of a healing journey for this country. Um, and I have a very strong sense that that can be a model for the rest of the world. Uh, hopefully one day when the world's ready to, uh, to end the wars and to really move into peace and into the new paradigm of the heart, we'll be able to have something like that, some kind of global truth and reconciliation commission to help us find the healing and the resolution around the world that we need. 
So I, I guess I felt like I just wanted to bring up this memory of the election and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on this very auspicious 30th anniversary to, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to help offer some inspiration um, in this time of very intense polarization and the, the shadow rising up all over the world. Um, I, I also, before we continue, I just want to be clear. I'm not saying South Africa is perfect by any means. Um, the shadow here is just as intense as other places, if not more so in many ways. Um, like I said before, every country's shadow is rising up right now, so it can be made visible. And, uh, you know, we, we need to shine the light on it and clear it and release it. Uh, but even though South Africa is, is still fraught with so many problems and so much corruption and such an extreme dichotomy between rich and poor and, and so forth. I mean, the, I could go on, but people in general, you know, people are doing their best to make this new South Africa work. I know a lot of people feel very hopeless about it, but I'm not one of them. I still very, I feel very hopeful for South Africa, just like I feel very hopeful for the world. I mean, a lot of people have also written off the world, but I don't. I, I see deeper than that. I still feel very hopeful for the whole world. <clears throat> Excuse me. I feel hopeful for the whole world because I believe that this massive shadow exposure and this intense polarization that's happening, it's, it's necessary. It's a, it's a necessary stage in the global awakening process. And we incarnated for these times. We knew before we incarnated that it wasn't going to be easy. We knew it wasn't going to look pretty. Clearing shadow never is. But we also knew that we would get through it to the other side and ultimately to the healing because that's our destiny. That is humanity's destiny to get to that place. That's where we're headed. And we've got so much support. I mean, the... Invisible realms are supporting us in unfathomable ways. And I'm sure if you're sensitive at all, you feel that. You know what I'm talking about. It doesn't look that way is the issue. When you look at the surface appearance, you just see the shadow and you feel the awful emotions and it just feels like all is lost. But if you've been on this path for any amount of time, and if you've been through even one significant shadow clearing process, you know that on the other side of it is a whole new world. It's a new reality. It's a new life. Once you've seen what you need to see and you feel what you need to feel, you know, you witness it, you clear it, you let it go. That's the freedom that we're all seeking. And that's the freedom for each of us and for the world that is on the other side of this mess that we, we seem to be in as a planet right now. So if you're feeling hopeless and depressed and disillusioned or whatever about the state of the world, I'm sharing all this with you today to help give a little bit of encouragement and maybe strengthen your hope a little bit. I truly believe that humanity's resourcefulness and our heart-centeredness and our courage, especially in the face of challenges and, and our compassion for our fellow human beings, will see us through this into the new paradigm of the heart. The new paradigm of the heart happens inside each of us as individuals first. We live it ourselves we manifest it in our own little way, in our, in our orbit, and it becomes our own little personal reality. And then eventually, when enough people are doing that and living in the heart, there's a tipping point. It's that, um, 
it's that principle of the hundredth monkey, you know, where the collective change happens kind of by osmosis, if you know that story. And suddenly everybody's doing the same thing. All the monkeys started washing their sweet potatoes together, even though they were on different islands and they weren't taught. But um, but it's a collective consciousness thing is the tipping point. Even though everybody's not taught how to do it or told about it, it still happens by osmosis anyway. And so that's such a great example. It just happens kind of magically because the truth is that that our thoughts and our feelings are not separate, you know. Consciousness is shared. And even though in the third dimension, things might look and seem like they're separate, we still, the truth is, we, we live in a shared reality. It's just like that experience that I was describing today of the unity consciousness that I had 30 years ago in Johannesburg. We were all thinking and feeling the same thing, and it uplifted us. You know, you could feel the joy. It was in the air. It was palpable. And even though, you know, we were, oh, the other thing that happened was, God, we were, uh, I remember before we left the United States for South Africa, the news was showing bombs going off and, oh, there might be a civil war and there's all this bloodshed. And we called our South Africa, everybody was so worried about us. You know, they were, our American friends were calling us, our family was saying, are you sure you want to go? And uh, we would call Leslie's family and our friends in South Africa and would say, well, what, what about this? What about this? And they would say, what? There's no violence. There's very little violence happening. There's not, don't worry about it. Come, we're fine. Everybody's okay. Just come. And um, And so it was a lot about you know, overcoming the fears and overcoming the false surface appearance of things. And when we did that, you know, when anybody does that, that's it's a universal principle. When we do that, we move into those higher levels of awareness, those higher levels of consciousness. And that's how we feel the joy. That's how we experience the breakthroughs and find the 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 deeper layers, you know, the forgiveness, the love, and all of that. And so that's how all of us are acting as midwives for the new paradigm of the heart, because we're birthing it in ourselves. One shadow clearing process at a time. And I, I guess that brings me, that reminds me, Corlite's tagline is change the world by changing yourself. And so I, I think that sort of brings us full circle and it feels like that's a good place for us to stop today. So I think it's time to move on to the questions. So first of all, thank you so much for your questions and all the sharing that you send to me. I, as I say every month, I'm so grateful. I really appreciate hearing from you. I love hearing your updates. I love knowing how everybody's doing, uh, getting little insights into things. And it helps me with these reports to get those updates from you. So even though, um, you know, I don't always have a chance to reply to everybody, I read everything. And in case you're new, uh, the way the way this Q&A works is you can email your questions in advance to courses at corelight.org. And... Um, as I said, it's it's not possible for me to answer all the questions, but I do read them all, and I do get to as many as I can. And if your question doesn't get answered by me, the answer always comes from somewhere else. The first question is from Sally. She says, Could you tell me exactly what you mean by Leslie's Enlightenment Anniversary? Enlightenment is a word I like to steer clear of as a statement of position. And there was more to the question I'm summarizing. So forgive me, Sally, but I just tried to summarize what you said. Um, and thank you for your question. I really understand what you mean. Enlightenment is such an overused term these days, isn't it? And I, I think it's also very misunderstood. People use it to mean so many different things. And we could talk for days about the question of what is enlightenment. So I'm just going to be brief here 
um, I'm going to be concise, let's say, as concise as I can be. Leslie used that term, enlightenment, for the spiritual awakening experience she had in 1988 uh, after her many, many years, decades of being on a conscious spiritual path. And as she described it, um, it was like a culmination. It was a culmination of so many years of doing the inner shadow clearing work and the meditation that she'd done. She, what happened was she went into a formal sitting meditation one day and it actually lasted three days without her getting off the, the couch. And so when she came out of that meditation, it was April 22nd, 1988. And she knew she'd been in meditation for a long time. She didn't know how long. So she went outside her apartment door and she found three newspapers on the doorstep. And so that's how she knew she'd been in meditation for three days. She was so kind of gone in consciousness that she said, you know, I don't even know if like if somebody had entered the room, would they have even seen a body on the couch? That was the kind of experience it was. Um so I guess I'm summarizing, uh, but over the following weeks, days, whatever, she realized that what had happened to her was that the, the old egoic structure that she had known as Leslie had completely dissolved and it never returned. You know, sometimes we have experiences of the dissolution of the ego and then it, it you know, it comes back, it, it uh, reasserts itself. And we always have the opportunity to process it away again um, and dissolve it. But uh, in this instance, it never returned. So it, this was a very um, pivotal milestone moment for Leslie. Uh, you know, it was the complete dissolution of her egoic self. And so that was her definition of enlightenment, the complete dissolution of the egoic self. And I know, uh, I know plenty of other teachers who define enlightenment differently. I think of Yogananda, uh, who, if you've ever read Autobiography of a Yogi, um, I've read it so many times. And what he says about enlightenment is he says, his definition of enlightenment is being able to enter the breathless state at will. I've experienced the breathless state, but I'm not able to enter it at will. It was such an extraordinary thing to experience. I experienced it a few times. Um, but wow, to be able to enter the breathless state at will, that's something else. Um, I know somebody else, another uh, another person I, whose opinion I respect, they, they said, um, think of enlightenment as simply a very, very, very deep relaxation. And I understand that. That makes sense to me. Because, you know, when we're so deeply relaxed in meditation, we have those satori experiences. And I know some teachers uh, make the distinction between enlightenment versus living in unity consciousness. I know there's another whole thing around that, too. Uh, so anyway, we could go on. There are many different ways of looking at this, different terms, different states, different milestones. Um, the way the way I look at it, I, I've spoken, I used to speak with Leslie about it and from my own uh, experiences as well. The way I look at it is like different arenas, different, um, it's, uh, let me say this, that, um, we're all on a continuum of the evolution of consciousness. And so I think everybody agrees that enlightenment or whatever you want to call it is not the end, right? It's not a, a, a I think what you said, the words you use for a statement of position, as you say, it's, um, it's a milestone along an endless journey of evolution. Our spiritual growth never ends. And I know that Leslie was always learning and growing in so many amazing ways. And, and she was always discovering new aspects of consciousness and integrating those awakenings into herself. She was a, a pioneer in consciousness. So there was definitely never a thought that 
it was over, you know, that it ended at a certain point. And I, I talked a lot more about this on the recent interview that I did uh, on Buddha at the gas pump. So if you if you wanted to hear more about this, uh, rather than my take time now to talk about it, um, you could you could go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P.com, Buddha at the gas pump. Um, and if the topic interests you, that's a great place to learn a, more about that question of what is enlightenment. The Bat Gap tagline is conversations with quote unquote ordinary awakening people. And, and so there are hundreds of interviews on there, people talking about these many, many different paths and the different stages of spiritual evolution. So that's a great place to do some research on it as well. I was just about to say something about the arenas, <clears throat> but I think I won't repeat that because I talked about it on Buddha at the gas pump. Um, that's another way of looking at it is by, you know, we're, we're, we live in different arenas and 90 some percent of the people on the planet live in one arena. We all have these certain agreements. And then the milestone moment of enlightenment is like moving to a new arena where we operate under a different set of rules. And I, I spoke more about it on the, on that bat gap interview. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that to, to answer your question, um, is that that Leslie talks a lot more about her enlightenment experience on that show. She was interviewed by the host of Bat Gap, Rick Archer, in 2010, which was the first year he started that show. So if you want to know more about Leslie's enlightenment experience, you can go to batgap.com and you can search by her name, Leslie Temple Thurston, and you can find it there. And my interview is there too, as I said. So anyway, Sally, I hope that's helpful, and I thank you for your excellent question. I'm grateful that you asked it. Hope hope that works for you. And the next one is from Preston. Should I be able to accept advice from someone that accepted advice from someone else other than themselves? <laughs> I thought that was a great question. Thank you for it. Um, I think... I pondered that question. I think the key to your question is in that word accepting. Uh, personally, the way I work is that I will listen to anybody. I'll read, I'll listen, I'll watch. Uh, you know, I'm wide open. I don't care where they get their information, whether it's from other people or books or teachers or dreams or inwardly in meditation or from uh, disembodied spiritual <laughs> entities or, you know, the internet or whatever it is, the, the source doesn't matter to me. I can, I can listen, uh, I can read, uh, I can watch no matter what the source is. The key for me is that I always practice what I call spiritual discernment when I take in any information. So it's, it's not just an automatic accepting of any advice. Um, discernment is actually the key. And discernment's an aspect of the witnessing practice that I keep talking about. I feel like I harp on the witnessing practice because it's so instrumental to this path of spiritual awakening that we're on. Um, and, and so it's really about using that witnessing practice to discern what feels true. What feels right to me? And I know that I can always reject anything that doesn't work for me. But I like to be open. I like to be available to any source of information, any kind of advice from anybody or anywhere. And I think there, there's another thing I want to say before I close out on your question. Um, one of the best practices that I've found that really works, especially the last few years, is this this practice I talk about sometimes of neither believing nor disbelieving. And that's a great one because then you can take in whatever anybody's saying and, and you just let the information be there without having to do anything with it. You know, you, you don't have to accept it. You don't have to reject it. Um, I, I just let it be what it is. I, I, I don't feel like I have to do anything about it. It, it just filters in, um, and I, I know through that process that I use of spiritual discernment 
eventually if it feels true or not, if it feels helpful or not. And and um, I just let go of anything that doesn't serve me. It actually naturally drops away. But I find if it has some meaning and is helpful, then it naturally stays. <clears throat> so also, just to be clear, I'm not saying that that this means we never form judgments, that we never form opinions. We do, but um, but we do it from that place of spiritual discernment. It's like I said, uh, you know, as we let things filter in, there's this practice that we do. It's a practice. Discernment is a practice. And it takes time to hone that skill. And I just find that it goes hand in hand with the witnessing practice. You know, they're, the two are direct, uh, they're, they're directly correlated with each other. Okay, I hope that helps, Preston. Uh, thanks for your question. If I misunderstood you, please let me know, but I hope that's helpful. And the next question is from Claudia. How can we align with the divine great plan for individuals and society while nurturing connection to Mother Earth? Thank you, Claudia. I, I thought your question was very interesting, very thoughtful, very concise. Um, I, think, I think these are actually one and the same thing. Uh, there's really in my mind, no difference between aligning with the divine plan for people and connecting with Mother Earth. They're not, they're not separate things. Um, our human journey is so much about returning to the laws of the natural world and remembering our, our oneness with her and reconnecting with that part of us. We're not separate from the rest of the natural world. The, the spirit that moves in all things moves as much in us as it does in the rest of the natural world. So, so yeah, I, um, I tend to think our path and Gaia's are one, intimately intertwined. Uh, after all, you know, our human bodies that we get to wear for a few years are made of earth, right? And they return to the earth when we're finished with them. It's just that we've forgotten a lot of this. So, uh, so now it's our time to remember. That's what's happening right now. As we birth the new paradigm of the heart, it's our time to remember. And, and if we look at that word, remember, Remember to become a member again. Um, it's about reclaiming our membership with our Earth family. We forgot we were members of the Earth tribe. We're one with trees. We're one with mountains. We're one with rivers, the oceans, the animals, the plants. But we've forgotten it. And so we're returning to that remembering. And your question, uh, specifically, I'm rereading your question. It's about how we align with the divine plan while nurturing the earth. So let me speak about that for a moment. Um, so first and foremost, I would say do any practice that works for you. Um, for, for me, meditation has been a very important practice. I don't meditate formally as much as I used to. I feel like I carry my meditation with me throughout the day, but uh, I think any kind of mindfulness practice that gets us to slow down, you know, and, and helps us get still and stop the mind chatter is helpful. Uh, the other thing I'm getting to say that is equally important is as meditation is doing the inner clearing work which is what I've talked so much about on the call today. Um, the reason for that, the inner clearing work is so important is because the clearer we are 
on the inside, the less mind chatter we have, um, the easier it is to to do that aligning that you're talking about, the aligning with the divine plan to to see our highest path more clearly, and and then we're also um, we're shown how to nurture the earth in the highest way. So yeah, meditation, shadow clearing work, two top like number one and two interchangeable things for me. Um, but it, it, you know, in essence, I, I think the greatest gift that we can give the earth or, or give anybody is our spiritual awakening. And to me, those two tools, meditation and shadow clearing, those are the keys for me. I know other people teach differently, but there are many, many ways. There are many methods, not just those two, but for me, those are the two most important things. Um, because our spiritual awakening, you know, when we, we, we bring that, we bring that high consciousness to everything we do and to everyone we meet. And it's, it's the greatest gift we can give to other people and to the natural world. And then let me see. There's just one last thing. Um, I would say also to spend as much quiet time in nature as we can. Um, you know, to, to be in nature is so healing and it just helps us to become so peaceful. And if, if you can't get out into nature, um, there are all kinds of other things you can do getting creative about how to access elements of nature. Like I think for, for me, for example, I find I have my deepest relaxation and my most creative insights when I'm in water. So uh, whether it's a warm bath or uh, a shower, you know, hot, hot and cold, hot shower, then a cold shower, uh, just water being a key element for me. And the other one is sunshine, taking in sunshine. So even if you're in a cold climate, you can find a window where the sun is pouring in and lie in the sunshine. Um, just things like that, you know, getting creative with whatever it is that feeds you from nature. It's very helpful. So the very last thing to say to you um, is that this um, the online course that I'm co-teaching with Anna Breitenbach for the love of animals, we offer a lot more on this exact topic. So if that interests you, we're like I said before, we're going to be launching it in the middle of May. And I would invite you to tune in inwardly and see if you're called to join us for that. And if so, I would love to see you there. So I hope that's helpful. And I thank you, Claudia, and I wish you all the best. Okay, we're almost at the end. I think let's do one more question. This one is from Maria. What is the difference between selfless service and being a martyr? And that is such a great question. Um, that is the question of our times. <laughs> so well done, Maria. I really... I really appreciate your asking, and I laugh because this is something that I think most people on a spiritual path struggle with, and, and personally, I, I can deeply relate. I have been through an enormous process in my life around this. I took many, many years to really work that one, that process you're talking about, the martyr process. So I can, sadly, I can speak about it with some authority. <laughs> So thank you for asking it. <laughs> um, you know, I realize like it's one of those topics that can be, you know, a, a whole seminar that could take a weekend or a week or whatever. So uh, it's not I'm not going to be able to address it in depth today, but I I'll just share a few things very briefly for now um, in the hopes that it's helpful. It's such a big question. Uh, so I made some little notes here. There are some bullet points because it's such a big question. I just wanted to touch on a few things. So the first uh, thing I wrote down here is a martyr is an archetype, a persona. The martyr is a savior who at the same time is also a victim. The martyr is the savior and the victim combined. So the martyr engages in... Uh, two specific things that I would call burden bearing and self sacrifice. And those are patterns. They're patterns that drain us. 
So even if we're if we're doing something um, out of love, you know, maybe a sense of of, of duty or or loyalty or you know some of these higher ideals. Um, if it's done out of balance, and if we're doing it in a win lose way, then we get depleted. It's got to be a win-win situation. We have to be fed by the service that we're offering as well. Because if we're not, we get depleted, it becomes a win-lose, and then we're drained, and it's not in the highest. But the other thing you ask about, selfless service, thats it's very different from the martyr persona. When we practice selfless service from a healthy place, from a place of balance, and from this sense of a of a, divla- a flow of energy, a divine flow of energy within us, like we're like we're drawing from a wellspring that's ever flowing, then we don't get depleted. We're supported, we're fed, um, we actually gain spiritual energy as a result of whatever service we're offering. And that's because it's a win-win. It's something that is is not a win-lose. Um, I know that that most people find, at least sometimes, that it's hard to tell the difference between these two things. So uh, it, it's it's part of our spiritual journey to learn about this, to learn about the difference, to learn, you know, how we do this, how we navigate that path. And we do that through practicing things like spiritual discernment, like I was talking about before, and also um, processing the patterns and clearing the shadow, like I've been talking a lot about today. So the first thing is that it's important to strengthen the witness around that process you're talking about. And also it's important to um, to feel into whatever the situation is from your heart and to become aware that you're feeling it from your heart and not from your head. Because the heart doesn't lie. The heart helps us to discern, to know what to do, but the head is the part that tells us that we should do something because it's the right thing to do. Um, but when we hear that word should, and when we feel it coming from the head, that's the red flag because because then we, are, we, we can become aware that it's a, probably a mental concept um, you know, it probably comes from some kind of programming we got from childhood or a habit we developed from something, even if it's out of duty or loyalty. You know, um, if, if, it's, if it's a should, that's the red flag. <clears throat> okay, so I, I feel like I should complete here because, like I said, this is such a big topic. And, um, and I feel like I should just leave it at that for now. Um, but I do have a couple of other referrals for you. If you want more on that subject, I've spoken about it a lot. I, I, I can't remember when or where I talked about it on these spiritual weather report calls, but I did. So if you go to, um, to the spiritual weather report archive page at, uh, Corelight's, uh, free resources page at corelight.org, uh, you go corelight.org and then you go free resources and then you go to the archive, the, the monthly call archive page, the podcast archive. And you look through the descriptions there and you'll, it's, there are, all the descriptions are written out and you can find more on that subject. And then um, the other thing to mention is I, I did, uh, I devoted a whole module, a whole session to this very topic on the, the course, the online course that I offered called The New Paradigm of the Heart, Transcending Victim Tyrant Consciousness. So if you go to our courses page at corelight.org, you'll see that course, the New Paradigm of the Heart course there. And you might consider taking that course because it really does dive deep into this very subject. Okay, 
So thank you, Maria, for your excellent question. I'm so grateful you asked it, and I, I really wish you all the best with that journey. Let me know if I can help further. All right, my friends, we've got about 10 minutes left, so let us wrap up for today and let us have our final meditation and prayer. So I invite you, if you're multitasking, I invite you to pause. Just take a few moments to stop and sit and get comfortable. Close your eyes and take a few long, slow, deep breaths. And just relax. Deeply, deeply letting go with each exhale. Breathing in the light. Breathing in this beautiful field of love that surrounds us. Feeling the deep peace and the love. And breathing out any shadow, any, any shadow that might have been stirred up by the mind during our discussion. Breathing in the light, breathing out the shadow. And so, as we breathe, I call on the Great Spirit. I call on all the beings in the invisible realms who surround us in the highest love and the highest support. And we're making an offering right now of the list of things that we can probably all agree on which I mentioned earlier today. And so if you agree with these things, uh, if, you're, if you're listening and you agree with these things, please hold the spirit of this prayer and this, this list in your heart with me as I make this offering. So great spirit, these are the things we all agree on. We're offering this list up to you and we ask for your grace in support of manifesting these important things in our lives and for the whole of the planet. We love the earth and we want a healthy environment. We love life and we want to see all life flourish. We all want good health. We all want safety. We all want prosperity, including having enough to eat, and having a place to live. We all want peace and no more war. We all want freedom. We all want to be loved and to be able to love whomever we want to love. And we give thanks, knowing that this is so. And while we're in prayer, let's just quickly say another prayer for peace. We pray for an end to war and for a deep, deep peace to come to our planet. Where there's war, let us show peace. Let us sow peace. Please make us instruments of your peace. We offer our hands and our hearts and our voice. Please protect and inspire and give courage to those who are working for universal peace. Courage for all whistleblowers. Protection for the whistleblowers, people in government, positions of power. Bless them, protect them, inspire them. And let's all just visualize the opening of the heart in the front and the back of the body. You can just imagine a funnel-shaped vortex like a flower that opens up in front of the chest. Petal by petal, opening up, 
like the heart chakra. And also in back, imagine a vortex opening out in back of the heart. And just feel this beautiful energy, this heart energy, flowing through the heart from front to back, clearing out the heart. Making our heart energy available, our love available to share. Feel it flowing from front to back and then reverse the direction and feel the energy flowing from back to front through the chest. Feeling this beautiful love energy passing through you. This is your love. This is who you truly are. your essence it's not separate from you and it's also actually the field of love that we all share it's a beautiful feeling it's a beautiful light and energy that surrounds us it's unconditional love this is who we are I invite you to just feel that and take it in Let it flow through your chest freely, cleanly. And now feel feel it expanding. Feel your love filling up your aura, filling up your body. You can visualize it as a color if you like, if that's helpful. Golden white or perhaps light pink. Sometimes people visualize the heart as green. Whatever you like. But just feel that beautiful heart energy, that love filling you up. Your physical body as well as your aura. And then let's also... Visualize ourselves surrounding the earth in a circle, holding hands. We are a collective of people from around the world. It's a very international group who attends these podcasts. So whether you're listening in the future or present time, it doesn't matter. There's no time and space at this level. So just visualize yourself as part of this circle, holding hands with this wonderful, loving group of people around the world, and we're surrounding the earth with our love. These beautiful love bodies that we are visualizing and feeling, our love light. And let's take a moment to share it with the earth, Visualize your heart beaming this energy right towards the earth. Feel it, see it going into the earth to Gaia herself and to all life forms, the whole of the natural world. Just filling them up with beautiful love and light and healing energy. We pray for this earth while we surround her with our love and our light. We pray that all of our thoughts and words and deeds may in some small way contribute to the happiness of all beings. We're so, so grateful for this opportunity to share our love and to be the hands and the hearts and the voice of the divine sharing our love with the world. So please, Great Spirit, hold our hands now as we walk out into the world 
into our soul's highest purpose. Help us to share our love with the world, to shine brightly always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alalaho. Isn't it wonderful? Oh. And when you feel ready, I invite you to slowly bring your awareness back into the room where you're sitting and into your body. Slowly begin to wiggle your fingers and toes. When you feel ready, slowly open your eyes. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for showing up. I'm so grateful that you're part of this field of love. Love you with all my heart. And I wish you well. And look forward to being with you again. As, as I said before, we're going to skip the May spiritual weather report because I'll be at a conference, and I'm sorry about that. But I'll see you in June. June 30th is the next spiritual weather report. So may you be blessed. May you shine your light brightly for the next couple of months. With all my love. Bye for now.